This is an interview with Abraham Ginsberg, Comfort Inn, Brooklyn, New York. It is the 20th of March, 2003, um, approximately 4.10 p.m. Uh, the interviewers are Mike Russard and Wayne Clark. Uh, could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My full name is Abraham Ginsberg. The place of birth is uh, New York City. The year was March uh, 12, 1919. Close to your birthday. Yeah, I was 84 just, just two weeks ago. Just Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, could you tell me your educational background prior to entering service? Well, uh, I went up to high school. I had one year of college, and I dropped out because of the Depression. And I was getting nowhere fast, and uh, I wanted to work. Mm -hmm. the, I got permission from the dean to leave. He said, if you leave, you're never going to come back. And he was right. I never came, except now, 60-odd years later. Where were you, and uh, what, if you can remember how you felt when you heard about uh, Pearl Harbor? Okay, I remember very well. It was a Sunday. I was listening to the uh, symphony concert, and I just didn't believe it. The next day, the president made the speech that this was a day that should live in infamy, and I remember that, too. Uh -huh. Did you enlist or were you drafted? Drafted. Okay. Um, did you select the Army Air Corps, or were you... Uh, uh, no, I was drafted into the what turned out to be the field artillery, because uh -huh. this was uh, a few months after Pearl Harbor. I think I was inducted February 2nd. Uh -huh. and. The, the medical, I remember walking through a door and I was being jabbed with needles on both sides and being processed. And the next thing I know, we were at a station waiting to board a, the train to take us someplace and I just fell asleep and I killed right over. <laughs> I woke up, they told me I was on the train going to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Is that where you were uh, inducted and where you had, well you had, we were inducted in New York City? Uh, in New Jersey, New Jersey. Uh, was it Camp Upton? I don't remember whether it was Fort Dix or Camp Upton. It was. I was. In, oh, I should have brought. I think Upton's discharge. on the island here. Uh, that's probably where I was discharged. Mm -hmm. But I was inducted. I, I really don't know. No, that's okay. I should have brought my. That's I meant to bring a copy of my discharge, but I forgot. Fine. Um. So you ended up in Fort Bragg. That's Fort where your basic training. That was the basic training, and then I was walking around. And I heard those 105 howitzers go off. I said, "This you get killed here, and I didn't want that. And they were recruiting for the Air Force at that time. Uh -huh. So I applied. Uh -huh. And uh, I went through the, the written exam with flying colors. The physical exam, uh, everything was fine except my eyes. I had no depth perception. And I remember the sergeant came, patting me on the shoulder. He said, don't, be, don't feel bad. So if you were a pilot, you would either land the plane 10 feet above the ground or 10 feet under. So that made sense. But at some time, I'm making you laugh, you know, you heard a lot of these stories. <laughs> then uh, a couple of months later, uh, word came down through headquarters that they had lowered the requirements for eyes, and if I wanted to take the physical again, I could. So this time I took it and was a little... New York maneuvering, I passed the test. That, did you ever see the? Can I tell them? Like sure, anybody sure. in trouble? Get in any okay. Trouble. The death perception test involved lining up two pegs mm -hmm. uh, on a on a like sort of a pan that was about six or nine feet long, and you had to line them up and match the two of them together, and you had three tri three tries. Uh, and then that's what happened. That's what finished me off the last time. So I tried again, and I thought I had it. No good. They, they walk you over. They could see I was about this far apart from the two of them together. The second time, I see the sergeants dancing up and watching, and I was a little closer. The next time, I watched him. I wasn't looking at the pegs. I was watching him. I could see. At this point, I stopped. Right on! So I, was, I was in the Air Force. I became a scholar and a gentleman instead of a private from, from that time. But of course, uh, I got washed out of the, uh, uh, the Air Force later on. So I ended up, let's see. You had that collision? 
<laughs> Forget it. There was all, all kinds of things. Some some of the stories are, I don't, don't want to talk about. It's really mm -hmm. too too hairy even today. But it all worked out because it kept me from uh, going overseas faster than I should have been. Mm -hmm. Most of the guys that were in, oh, I ended up, I couldn't be a pilot regardless. I ended up uh, going to bombardier training. And uh, we went on, on a training on the, the northern bomb site. Everything was fine, except all of a sudden I wasn't getting a target. And I found out about years later that the, the, the lieutenant guy who was in charge of the training Mis misinformed me, because at the time when the bomb site said uh, you're going to release the bombs, we were supposed to. Uh, I, you said to release uh, the switch, which immediately threw the whole thing off. So instead of going on the path that I had said, the thing went on its own way. And but that that really saved my life, because I would have been in the class of 4318, and that class was utterly wiped out, because at that time the Germans were knocking the 8th Air Force guys out of the sky like crazy. And then I got pneumonia, and that uh, straight uh, set me back another time. And then, oh no, first I got pneumonia. Then then I went back to to, to get uh, this, this the training, and that was it. I was, the training was rough, really was rough. I got involved in a crash, a collision, sort of, and I ended up in a hospital for a while, blinded. Then I had surgery. Oh, that was another time, the surgery. Anyhow, the next thing I knew, I was out of the air, uh, out of the flying part, but since I was in the Air Corps, they sent me to radio operator training, which I did well. Then we went to a gunnery training school, and I did well, except we had to do uh, skeet shooting. Have you ever done skeet shooting? Mm -hmm. I don't know why it knocked the hell out of my shoulder. I couldn't do it. So finally, instead of putting the thing on my shoulder, I just kept like this, and I kept knocking the skeet like crazy. But <laughs> they passed me. <laughs> so where are we? Oh, then finally uh, I was assigned to Lincoln, Nebraska, where uh, to meet the crew that uh, we were going to uh, be formed. Someplace along the line I had pneumonia. I don't remember where. Mm -hmm. That's okay as long as it fits in there. And so in uh, was, Nebraska is where you picked Nebraska your plane where we crew picked up? up? Yes. And we, we were supposed to ferry a brand new uh, B-17 over to England. And then I said, I had some kind of pain in my eye, and I went for a checkup, and I, they told me I needed eye surgery. So that took me off the crew. My crew got another guy. I didn't know them. They went off, and I was in Nebraska. After I think I was in the hospital for about two weeks. I don't remember. And then finally, they put me on a crew where some other radio operator was taken off. Turned out later, his mother had died, and he had to go see her. And that was the crew I ended up with. And they really resented me, because they trained all along with this guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I was not it. But, and also I was a New Yorker, and they were all from the Midwest, and except for our pilot who was from California. But uh, just on the ground we didn't do so well. In the air, we all respected each other's ability, and uh, that was, so we got along pretty well. And so um, when you picked up the B-17, uh, did you stay with that plane all the way through, or did you just ferry that one across? Oh, we, that was a ferry. We ferried it. Mm -hmm. And that is a story, too. That's what we want to hear? That's a story, too. We went to Manchester, New Hampshire. It was in the winter. It was just before Christmas, I remember, a couple of weeks. And there were a whole bunch of uh, ships that were flying across the thing. We, then from there we went to Goose Bay. Uh, I forget where that was. Labrador? Goose Bay. It was Labrador. No, it was Goose Bay and Blue, Bluey West. Goose Bay, Labrador. And that was the first time I ever saw all the snow that they had there. <clears throat> the snow seemed to be about 10 feet high, and uh, they had plowed runways and everything in the snow. 
So we waited till the winds changed and we took off and then we went to Bluey, Bluey West in Gander. Gooseberg, in, I think that's it, I don't remember. I think that's Newfoundland. Yes. Were you an Air Force? <laughs> <laughs> no, I flown that uh, yeah. leg though. Oh, okay. And I'm listening to the radio and and I don't hear any messages, but I'm looking out the window, and I see a lot of planes are coming uh, back to where we came from. And I spoke to the pilot. He, he walked off. I'd gotten any messages. I said, no. It turned out that there'd been a recall, that the weather at this uh, uh, bluey west had socked in, and they weren't accepting any, uh, any planes, because there was only one runway, and you could only land uh, when the winds were right. Well... We were going in because we were practically out of fuel, and the wind wasn't right, but we made it. And we were stuck there for, oh, uh, over Christmas, I think. And then we flew to uh, uh, Greenland, which was anything but green. It was a terrible place. And there we had a state over Christmas. And again, the weather socked in, and we were there. And we were the only plane, the only plane there at that time. Then some more came in, and we were supposed to take off. When all of a sudden a gust of wind came and lifted up the truck that was refueling us, and it put a dent in the aileron in our plane. So there we were stuck. We had to wait for another aileron, and that was New Year's Eve, I remember. And we were the only. Uh, uh, GI flight personnel on on the base. So all the nurses made a big deal out of us. We had a we really had a party. They even let us go into the officers' club. And then I made a stupid remark saying I'd never been drunk in my whole life. And the minute I said it, I knew it was a mistake. <laughs> and they would kept plying with with the liquor. Uh, you heard these stories. I think she's still laughing. Okay. They kept plying me with liquor, and that was it. The next thing I know. I'm in bed in the, in the Quonset hut, and somebody's hollering, fire, fire. And I woke up and laughed, ha ha, fire, and I went back to sleep. <laughs> they dragged me out, it turned, and it turned out there was a fire, <laughs> uh, but I didn't do anything about it. They, they put one of those uh, tin, number 10 cans under me that took care of my, my sickness, and I was fine the next day, but the rest of them were, were really hungover. And, then, oh, then the winds came, and they started putting sandbags on top of the wings to break up uh, that airfoil, or whatever you call it. And we, the enlisted men, had to stay in the plane. The, the officers were off, and we were sitting in our plane, and the wind was coming 90 miles an hour or more, and you could feel that plane wanting to take off. That was a pretty scary thing. But for, oh, and then we were, at that time, we were in Reykjavik. In Reykjavik, and in, 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 yeah, that was in Greenland. So finally, the weather changed, they fixed the aileron, and we were off. Meantime, we've been hearing stories about a lot of uh, the planes that were getting uh, wrong signals from German subs uh, that were setting them off course, and a lot of them had to ditch. So we were very careful. Anyhow, I didn't get any messages, we didn't have to ditch, and we ended in, in uh, Prescott in Scotland. And there they took the plane away from us, and they shipped us to uh, some other place, and then ultimately we ended up in, in uh, the 490th bomb group that were with the replacements. But I remember thinking, these people are talking English, but I can't understand them. <laughs> it was really quite... Uh, I got to like the English people. I love their sense of humor, because it's almost like mine. I'm more out with it, but they're subtle, and they don't give you a hint of how they're smiling, but they were funny. So you, you had uh, good relationships with the English pe population then? I did, mm -hmm. really did. Mm -hmm. With the kids, with those few that, we, that weren't in, in London, because most of them had been shipped to uh, outlying little towns to get them away from the bombs, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, I liked the English people, mm -hmm. I really did. So one old guy in a pub said to me, he said, you know what the trouble with you Yanks is? You must have heard this. He said, you're overpaid, overfed, oversexed, and over here. <laughs> and then he patted me on the shoulder. Uh, did you keep the same 
play after you were assigned a plane? Did you keep the same plane no, over there? No, we we became part of uh, the squadron, and we flew various planes. We didn't have a plane all our own. Mm -hmm. You never named a plane, or yes, I did. You did, but it was a print. We were flying in a plane called the Raiden Maiden. And it's been publicized not too long uh, recently in the 490th uh, newsletter. Uh -huh. uh, I named our plane, we, uh, we ended up as a lead crew. So I named our plane, uh, I was talking, I didn't I know, the leading, leading lady. The next thing I know about, a week later, all of those GIs on my plane have leather jackets and leading lady was on the back. They didn't tell me anything about it. I never had a leather jacket. I just had that uniform that they issued me and the flight, the coveralls were about three sizes too long. And my pilot wanted me to trade it in. I said, no, this is what they issued me. This is what I'm going to wear. I just rolled it up and we flew in. So. Raiden made, oh, I may have pictures of the Raiden. And you Raiden did Raiden. keep the same, you were the same crew? Yeah, for a while. Then uh, our co-pilot, the only one I really liked, they took him off and they put him on another crew. And then uh, <coughs> they took away our ball turret gunner because they put radar in it and we had uh, a Mickey operator came. And I just heard from him about three weeks ago. We wanted a picture. So, could you explain to us? We've had that term before, and we know. But if somebody looks at this video, what's a Mickey operator? A Mickey operator was a new radar uh, navigation device, and so that you can spot the target easier. I don't quite know exactly how it worked, but it worked. It worked because we hit the target with him. Most of the time, we didn't mm -hmm. before him. So this was put into your ball turret? Uh, the, the mechanism was the ball turret and he, his office and his equipment was on the other side of the plane. I had like a little alcove, little cubicle that uh, where my radio set was in the seat. And the funny thing was a couple of years ago they had the B-17s coming in uh -huh. and Floyd Bennett. I couldn't get into the plane with, without difficulty and to get into that seat, forget it, there's no way I could. <laughs> Did you wear a flak jacket? Uh, I sat on it. Okay. Rather than aware, we were trying to protect the family jewels. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do um, you want to talk about some of your missions? Or? The missions. I kept a diary, and I can't find it. I, uh, I think my parents threw it out with my uniform when they moved out, and I moved it out. I don't remember too many of the missions. How many did you fly? We flew 17. One more, I would have been 18, I would have gotten another oak leaf uh, for my air medal. Mm -hmm. So I have the air medal in one cluster. Do you remember where most of your targets were? In Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, one target, one, the last one was clear across Europe in a Russian place. It was, uh, I can't remember the name. But I remember after the plane warmed up and just before we were ready to take up, they topped the tanks because we needed every drop of fuel we were going to get. Uh, I can't remember the name. It was over 17 hours. The whole... Uh, could have been that long. It must have been. It must have been. Now, did you have a heated flight suit that you wore? Yeah, we had an electric suit, yes. Did you ever have any problems where you received any frostbite or anything? Uh, no, but I have a story that, okay, we were coming back from the mission and I hear the pilot and co-pilot uh, talking and all of a sudden we start getting uh, flack uh, and the pilot says, uh, give me my hat, my, my cap, he put his, he had used it as a urinal and it froze and then when I started putting the, when the flack came on, he started putting the hat on and the coat on. Maybe that's why he was never with us again after that. <laughs> so that was one of the stories. Now, one of the missions, one of our ball gunners was, was shot and died. And I, I, I tried to keep the blood from coming out. That's a mess. Didn't work out. The flak hit us. And he was the, the waist gunner a little bit behind me. He got it and I didn't. Did you ever get bounced by fighters? 
Uh, well, yes. That was my first uh, time that I saw that black uh, fighter squadron. I forgot which one they were. And they were good. I forget the number, but I'll never forget. I looked out the window, and there's this guy flying practically on our wind, and with the thumbs up and a black face, smiling. And I found out, I'd never known we had uh, a group of black fighter pilots. They were good, and they, they uh, intercepted a lot of the um, ME-109s on our tail. And then, on one of the missions, our, our bombs had been, uh, our targets were mostly strategic. We were uh, bore bearing plants, uh, synthetic fuel plants, and one time, uh, I hear the pilot screaming again. He never saw, he said, they're coming too fast. So, from the, from the window, I couldn't see in front, I could see the side. But I saw suddenly, they were like, like, bombs coming at us. It turned out it was the German, uh, the, their jet planes, the oh, first ones they had. Yes. And this is where our strategic bombing had paid off. They didn't have enough fuel except for that one pass at us. So they missed us and they got both of our wingmen. And that was it. And shortly after that the war ended. Now you, uh, I noticed you said that you had a very unusual duty um, flying uh, concentration camp prisoners? Oh, to England. yeah. Uh, after the war officially ended, well, no, it didn't officially end. The fighting stopped. So one of the missions we had to fly was a, a, a concentration camp in France. And are you familiar with the bomb site, the bomb uh, bay area in the B-17? Mm -hmm. It's not much from where I am to where you are and about this wide. Well, in that short, small page, they put in over 20, 20 uh, French people, men and women, mm -hmm. who were so thin that normally you could get maybe eight people at the most. Here they had 20 people in. And then after we landed back in the States again, they deloused us, they made us burn, they took our uniforms away, the flight uniforms, and burned them and sprayed us with uh, some kind of delousing material. And then another mission we, we flew was uh, in, in uh, Amsterdam. The Germans had flooded the dikes, and uh, the Dutch people were starving. So we were flying food, dropping the food to them at a low, low level. And suddenly, some of the Germans in the outskirts started shooting at us uh, with machine gun fire. We had no weapons. so. One of the guys said, why don't we drop the food on them? So the pilot, we veered a little bit, we dropped food, but I don't know if we hit them. But the next day we came back, a day or two later, and this, I don't know if you've seen, they had, on the, the, on the airfield that we were dropping the food, they wrote, thank you boys, out of tulips. Oh, oh here's the car. The White Cliffs of Dover, where the heck is it? Well, did you uh, drop any food drops into the troops in uh, in the Battle of the Bulge? No, no, no. We were, some... That's when we were uh, socked in and uh, uh -huh. uh, coming there. Because uh -huh. I thought, oh boy, I played it right, I turned right, the war's over. Then we hear about the Battle of the Bulge, and I thought, oh God, here I am right back in the middle of it. No, I wasn't, uh, we weren't there then. Yeah, you because know, I know some units, I think some of the B-24s dropped uh, food supplies and ammunition in. Did you ever see any USO shows while you were over? Uh, a few, yeah. <laughs> There's yes. a glass of water there, a few. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I can, I can find the... Uh, all right. One. Actually, the biggest one I saw, the USO show, was when I was in the States, when I was still with the 9th Division. Um, Betty Grable came, and she made a big hit. No, they, once we were in, uh, in, in England, in the flight area, they left us pretty much alone. Mm -hmm. They had one, I was only there actually uh, for about three months, not from about January of 44 till the the war ended for us in about April. So I wasn't there too much. And since we were a lead crew, 
we did fly uh, as often as the other guys did, and we only would have to fly 25 missions against the 35 missions. The rest of them would fly. So your plane had a bomb site on it then as a lead bomber? Oh, yes, we had a bomb site, yes. I know, because some of the others went That's right, the they lead. dropped on our, on our command. Uh -huh. um, what, uh, what was your reaction when you heard the death, about the death of President Roosevelt? I was shocked and sad because I quoted him for all the times. But I remember seeing him in newsreels that they showed us and he looked pretty sick to me. Uh -huh. But mm -hmm. that was it. Mm -hmm. Were you ever aware of the concentration camps? Yes, uh, as a Jew, we heard mm -hmm. of these stories even before I went into the army. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the the French people that you took out were were they Jewish or were they? I don't think so. No, laborers. They, or? I, I really don't know. We had no mm -hmm. contact with mm -hmm. them because it was a short flight from yeah. where we picked yeah. them up, <coughs> and they moved them away from us as mm -hmm. quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. But I don't think they were political prisoners. They just, well, they may have been political prisoners, uh -huh. but I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, when you return back to the States, then uh, what did you do after the, the end of the war? There's another story you reminded me of. <laughs> When we were flying back to the States, <clears throat> we didn't fly the plane that we would normally flew. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It was a war weary that they were bringing it back. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> well, I'm sitting in the plane, it just didn't feel right. And I went over to the pilot and I said, oh, I don't like the way this plane feels. He said, you know, I don't either. But we went and we took it about eight or nine other people that were going to get a ride back to the States with us. Well, sure enough, someplace along the line, we caught on fire. I forgot where we landed. Oh, in Presque Isle, Maine. <clears throat> and but when the engine started on fire? I don't know. I really don't remember. Because uh -huh. by that time I was pretty scared. Yeah. And when, when we got out and our navigator was a big guy. And you know, the, the, over his head there was a an opening that he would do his navigational stuff that uh -huh. he couldn't fit through, but he fitted through there all right. The next day we went back and I put my finger on the plane, my finger went right through the, the, uh, the aluminum. And we were there for a long time, evidently they lost our records, we were there for about three, or three weeks, a payday came by, we didn't get paid because nobody knew where we were. Finally they caught up with us and they sent us back uh, to, the, to where we were uh, on furlough till they were going to reassign us to B-29s and go to uh, Japan. That was when the first atom bomb was dropped. Mm -hmm. and, and I used to be an avid science fiction reader, so I knew the implications of what the atom bomb was. And then, I think it was a week later, the second one in Nagasaki came, and right after that the war came to a scream. What was your reaction when you heard about the two atomic bombs? Okay, the first was horror. But the second was relief, because, again, that saved my life. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the parallel with today's uh, with situation. It's terrible with the Iraqis, but it's either them or us. You can't be humane sometimes. That's it. And I, I think this will set an example and may make life a little easier for, for Americans for a while. Am I, can I sure. put in a sure. opinion? That, what, uh, did you use the GI Bill when you returned? Yes. I went to drafting school and uh, my brother-in-law was an engineer, but somehow that wasn't for me and I dropped out, mm -hmm. dropped out of that. Because I was primarily a photographer and I wanted to go to uh, electronic engineering because I could see where the, where the trend was going. But uh, there was a four-year waiting list. I said, well, but I'm one of the first guys to come out. I had the flying, the combat. Mm -hmm. These were the guys who were in the States, uh, civilians who never were overseas, and they knew even better than I did uh, what was going on with these different mm -hmm. schools, and they signed up. I wasn't going to wait four years to go to school. Mm -hmm. So I met some friends who introduced me to a guy who was a photographer, and he trained me in photography, and right about that time I met our 
Is that good or bad? <laughs> you don't have to tell me. <laughs> so, how well, long have you been married now? 52 years. That's great. Um, did you ever use the 5220 Club? Uh, yes. That's uh, the money they gave you. Yes, oh, yes. yeah, I use it all up. <laughs> I forgot all about that. Um, did you uh, join any veterans organizations and have you joined any? I never was a joiner. Uh -huh. I kept away from that. Until about two, is it two years ago? Until it's yeah, awful. influenced him. One of the friends of that we have was a wheeler and dealer. And he told me, I, I got to do him a favor. I have to join the Jewish war veterans because uh, they need members. Mm -hmm. So I joined and I looked around. I, we're, we're the guys who won the war and you look at us, you wouldn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a member of the Jewish war veterans. Have you joined the 8th Air Force uh, Association at all? Oh, yeah. You forgot I that. forgot that. Uh, again, through her. She goes to the movies one time and comes. She says she's sitting next to a guy. Can, can she tell the story? Sure. Yeah. You tell the story. Oh, it's funny. Abe went to the bathroom, and uh, this, this uh, gentleman is sitting next to me, and he's wearing a bombardier jacket. And I see the insignia on the jacket is Eighth Air Force. And I said, oh my. So I started chatting with him. I said, my husband was a member of the Eighth Air Force. Uh, maybe you know one another. I said, he'll be back in a minute. He said, so when Abe came, they started chatting before the movie began. And he, he was a member of the Eighth Air Force Historical Society, mm -hmm. which we honestly had not known about until he told us. Mm -hmm. And he told us who to contact, the sec who was the New York State Southern uh, Wing uh, President, Larry Goldstein. And he recruited Abe immediately, you know. And we started going to meetings and luncheons, and uh, uh, really I felt it was a very important organization. Uh, their motto is keep the memories alive, and you know, uh, I realized that they're all going to be gone soon. That's why I feel this project is so important, too, that uh, the work they do is very important, you know, as it relates to the museum and the events that uh, they participate in, the air shows and all of that. Uh, several museums, not uh, the new one that you're talking about in uh, upstate, but uh, other museums and... Uh, Okay, Farmingdale. So turn the yeah. camera back on me. The only chance I'm getting to talk. No, that's no, true. One last thing, and because of his membership there, he's met people, uh, he's re been reunited with people who had been on his crew with men. That's what I think is oh, so important. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a fact? Oh, yeah. It's because of your membership. Story. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was going to ask you that if yeah. you've been yeah. in contact with Yes. A few years ago, I had some uh, surgery, and I came home. And the day I came home, I got a call from a guy who was my co-pilot uh, from California. And we had some talking, and because I, I wasn't in contact with any, because as I told you, I really wasn't a member of the crew, and we weren't there that long to form any kind of uh, relationship. But the co-pilot was the guy who used to read my letters to censor them, and he told me he enjoyed uh, reading my mail. Okay, fine. I guess he got a vicarious trip <laughs> at him with the letters I sent to my different friends. And then uh, <clears throat> I get a letter from some guy in England who says he's doing archives on the 490th bomb group. And did I have anything that uh, I could contribute to him? So I sent him I made a Xerox copy of some of the pictures in the book, and he sent me a letter back saying uh, what I did to him wasn't fair. It's like sending a kid in a candy store uh -huh. and uh, telling him he could only pick one or two of the things. Well, anyhow, he uh, told me which ones he wanted printed from them. I made him a set of prints. And then, about in the last issue of the 490th uh, publication from the guy down saw George Pickard, who was the, the president, uh, they're printing a, a like 
a new edition of the book they had done before. So I called Eric Swain, the guy, the archivist, and asked him if my pictures were going to be in this book. So he said no. So I, I brought him back saying, when? He said, it'll be about 20 years. I said, great, that's life insurance. I'll wait till <laughs> I'll buy the book when you send it. When you send and uh, have it printed, I want an autographed copy. And then shortly after that, the Mickey operator I want to know if I had any pictures, because evidently one of the pictures that are in the book of him, he'd heard of and he wanted it. Oh, and then Hollis Steerkopf, again, the co-pilot, called me afterwards, and he uh, must have been again from this guy who was contacting everybody. I uh, wanted some pictures, so I had some pictures of him in the plane, the Raiden Maiden, and so on. And then a couple of pictures when we had a forced, a forced landing in Paris. Tell us about that. You didn't yeah. tell us about that. Or you... That was, I, I don't remember what we were doing there, but I think we had dropped off some people in France. This was again when the shooting stopped, and they had strict orders, no landing in Paris. But our pilot said, you want to land in Paris? <laughs> hey, Artie, I hope I'm not getting you in trouble over this. <laughs> so we landed in Paris, forced landing, and we... Had a really a good time. I have some pictures of all this stuff, but we paid plenty for it because when we came back, the officers I don't know what kind of reprimand they got, but they put us police in there for about a week, confined to the base, picking up all the garbage, and cigarette butts, and so on. So, uh, but we were in Paris and our pictures <laughs> to, to prove it. How do you think uh, your military service affected your life? Well, it did, because when I saw how the English people lived and responded to the treatment that they, uh, with the buzz bombs and all that, my respect for them increased immeasurably. Their homes were bombed, they used to sleep. At, at 10 o'clock or 10.30, the underground ceased running and they would sleep in the stations. And if they could do it, in the light of the terror that, they, in fact, on one of those trips, on one of my leaves in uh, Paris, I got knocked, not Paris, in London, I was knocked out of my bed by a buzz bomb that landed a couple of blocks away. So I couldn't wait to get back to the base where it was safer. We could see the buzz bombs flying over our base. And there are so many stories I forgot. Well, why don't you show us this guy? This guy, okay. This guy. <laughs> That picture is not in here, Abe. I don't know. It what, isn't? No. Uh-oh. Oh, you have That's more than one good. photograph in there. I just thought there was just the one. No. This is, this is the way I used to look when I helped win the war and make the world safe for democracy. <laughs> not the way you guys are seeing me now. When was that taken? Uh, this was taken right after I washed out of the Air Force, out of the Air Corps. It had to be in 1940s. 43 or 44? You mean you washed out of officer's training? Yeah, washed out of officer's training. Yeah, but training. you didn't wash out of the Air Force. No, they put me, that's what I became in a, 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 a the gunnery training. Is that enough? Well, what, are there other photographs of you? Uh, perhaps he's, he's got another. Abe, uh, you know, you didn't tell them about the, the fact that you were interviewed and a book was written. Uh, no, no. That, that was also no. through the 8th Air Force. Uh, Historical Society. See, here, this is some of the things that we used now to Now, if find. you hold it back a little hold bit, Wayne will be able to pan in on it. This is it. what flak looked like. And when we looked out the window, we saw that stuff in my mind's eye. I could really hear, hear boom, even though it didn't say boom, but I could hear it. Did you ever have many pieces come through your plane? Not one time when one well, you said, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and who are these other people? In this photograph. Oh, this was uh, one of, he was a waste gunner, and these were a couple of Canadian people we met in Paris right, when we were, no, that was in London, it wasn't Paris, that was London. Okay. So you're talking about my experience with the military, how I feel about it. Well. My wife knows I'm, I'm up nights now, I can't sleep with this situation that's happening. And the parallel between what was happening in our country when Hitler took power and what's going on now struck me. Mm -hmm. Even though 
the, the sky, Saddam Hussein is no Hitler, but he's a menace just as Hitler was. And you can't let people like that with the, the weapons of a total annihilation in their hand get a chance to use it. We have the atom bomb. We've had it, and we only dropped it twice. We haven't used it at all. These other ones, if they get it, they're going to try to to take us down because we have it. So we have to be strict. You can't go by saying all oh, innocent people are going to be killed because innocent people always get killed in automobile accidents, in the Twin Towers. Less people will be killed if we take care of this guy now and perhaps the other ones will will learn their lesson and not uh, try this stuff. So, do you know a guy by the name of Gaddafi? Another one from Libya? Mm -hmm. We gave him one shot and he quieted down, you don't hear anything from him. So I hear myself talking as complete antithesis to the guy I used to be. But the reality is, you can't be good if the other side doesn't match your goodness. If it's, they're going to use your goodness to take advantage of you and ultimately kill you, you can't do that. You have to. It's either them or us. It's got to be them, not us. That's it. I think that should be my closing. Okay. My closing Good. remarks. Well, thank you very much, you. sir.